So I want to talk a little bit about suffering, why we suffer. It's a fun topic, right? <laughs> it's light. <laughs> yeah, it's light. You know, a nice, you know, you can, topic that you can talk about over breakfast or over lunch or dinner or, you know, anything, you know. And, um, Buddhism. and Buddhism kind of gets a bad rap, you know, about this topic of, of suffering. But it, it actually, you know, can be a little bit liberating. And I'm going to try to make it as liberating as possible this evening here. To label us, you know, as any kind of tradition or, you know, first of all, I, I would say that this is probably a Buddhist um, meditation center. And I would probably say that it's uh, Theravada as opposed to Mahayana or, um, you know, some of the other traditions. Mahayana and Theravada being the, the, the bigger ones, or the primary ones. Most of my teachers were uh, either in Thailand or Sri Lanka, you know, which is, these countries are, are dominantly, uh, very dominantly Theravada. And um, that's my, my background, so that's why we um, would say that we're Theravada, Theravada Buddhists. And Theravada translated means teachers of, uh, teachings of the elders. And so it's like the, the very first, um, very careful to just use the very first teachings that were um, written down by Ananda, Buddha's assistants, assistant. And um, from those teachings are the, um, the many sutras and the, you know, the information that we, that we have as far as uh, the teachings go. The suffering is a core part of Buddhism. Um, the Buddha's very first teaching, he mentioned suffering right away. The first teaching that he gave, you know, of course, was the Four Noble Truths. And he said that we suffer um, as beings. Um, and I kind of feel, uh, you know, the word dukkha, that they, the Pali word for, for suffering, dukkha, means uh, points more towards stress than anything else. And it is kind of like, the uh, incompletion, the feeling of being incomplete. But we do have darn right suffering, you know, from time to time, you know, everything from grief to, um, to pain within the body and all sorts of things, you know. The, um, us humans, that's a part of our life, you know, it seems to be a part of suffering. And, and I'm sure everybody in here has suffered to some degree. And it would be amazing if one of you didn't. And even, um, even the Buddha, you know, he suffered. He, he suffered at the end. He had, when he died, he um, had a, a stomach disorder, you know, from eating some bad food. And he was, was not comfortable. You know, he was actually suffering, you know, even when he died. So in that first teaching that he said, he said that we do suffer because we're human uh, or we're beings, period. But he went on to say that the, the suffering is caused by our desires. Then he went on to later say uh, in, the, in the second or the third noble truth that, that there's a way, there's a remedy for this. And that remedy is the uh, practice of the path, the path that he set out. And many people would, interpret that as the Eightfold Path. In the, in the Theravada tradition, it would be the Eightfold Path, which consists of some wisdom teachings and morality and the practices of, of concentration and, and mindfulness. Uh, and um, we'll talk about the Eightfold Path sometime. Maybe next week we'll talk about that a little bit. But the question comes up, Oftentimes, and people get confused that they, they feel like, well, I shouldn't have any desires. If I'm going to be a good Buddhist or even a good person, I shouldn't have desires. And is that, I mean, is that right? I mean, how can we live without having desires? You know, how can, how can that be? What if we took that word um, desire and called it the, the word that I really prefer to to use is preference, preferences, preferences. You know, we have preferences for this, we have preferences for that, we have preferences to be this way or that way. 
And when we, when we look at these preferences, we can see that they are um, directly related to wanting something you know, different in the future or wanting something that happened in the past to, be, to, to change, to be different. And so when we are resting in the present moment, like in meditation, um, if we can manage to set aside the past and the future, we can actually sit in meditation um, or um, be living in a state of mindfulness uh, in this present moment and not have any desires for a while. And um, it's very, very worthwhile to notice those moments when we don't have desires. Because that is actually... Um, Part of the part of the states that the, that the Buddha was talking about. That's why he said we should, you know, he said meditation can be very pleasurable, but that's the kind of pleasure that we should cultivate, you know, because that pleasure is basically from the relief of our desires, the relief of wanting things to be different from what they currently are, which is, um, I think, a very good definition of desires or even the preference for things to be different than what they currently are, or the desire for things to be different from what they currently are. And so when we're in that, in, in the present moment, I mean, truly resting in this state of mind where there are no thoughts of the past or no thoughts of the future, we just rest in that, there are no desires. Desires, uh, the, the state of desire can... Um, encompass the, the, the past or the future or both at the same time. So it's very interesting. But in the present moment, we will see that, there, um, that everything is fine, that we don't desire for anything to be different. Because if we started desiring for things to be different, we would notice that we're leaning towards the past or the future, and that we would have these desires that cause um, suffering for us. But there is a way, <laughs> thankfully, there is a way for us to uh, plan, you know, for the future and, and, and uh, have goals in life. And to, I mean, I have, it was my preference to come here and have the opportunity to, you know, meditate with you guys this evening. So that's a, that's a, that's a preference. But it wasn't... Um, annoying it wasn't like suffering you know it wasn't causing suffering or anything like that it might cause suffering if I had a flat tire and I was late and I couldn't get here and um, I'm calling and you know uh, you know trying to f you know figure things out and all that um, that would be a uh, that would be a, uh, kind of a uh, some restlessness and worry tied into that but we can, we can plan, we can um, think of our future, we can think about things that happened in the past, all these things, while we're resting in the present moment. And so that takes a great deal of mindfulness to be able to do that. To be very, very much aware that we are planning something for our future, but, but knowing that we are resting in this this moment, we're de like we're doing it in this present moment. Of course, we always are. I mean, that's the only thing that there really is, is this present moment. But our minds will take us into the future, and it'll take us into the past, too. And that's, that's where the suffering actually comes from. The incompleted tasks, the things that we have to fix, the things that we want to be a certain way, with the plans that we make that we... We don't want to follow up, like our retirement account or something like that. All these different things. The um, when we grieve, you know, for from from missing somebody, most of the grieving comes from the broken plans that are are no longer a part of our lives. The plans that we made with somebody, and now they're those plans are. They, we feel like we're robbed, you know, of our our goals and our plans that we made with this other person. That's a you know, big part of grieving. And that can be a big part of any kind of loss or any kind of suffering that we, that we experience. 
so far what I said is that we can plan ahead if we know that we're in the present moment, that we understand that we're in this present moment. And really what that means is realizing that, that when we are planning, or when we're thinking about the past as well, that there is this self-image and this identity that is placed in that. Like I want to fix something, I can, I can, it's almost like I can visualize myself doing it in the future and that my identity is wrapped around that. Let's say I have a big project, I want to finish writing a book that I started a while back and I can, my identity is to finish that book. And if I wouldn't have that complete or if I don't have a clear picture of doing it, how to do it and how, how it would be, you know, uh, be a part of being, com you know, in that completion state, it would cause suffering. It would cause suffering for me. And that's where, our, and that's where that suffering uh, comes from. Our identity with the self that is doing the fixing or the identity of the self that completed or did something in the past that um, that we regret, for example. You know, even the Buddha, who most people would recognize as being an enlightened being, uh, certainly he made plans, you know, for the future. He, um, he taught a lot of people, a lot of things. He probably organized, you know, different um, events. It's kind of, you know, kind of strange to think about the Buddha, you know, organizing something with a bring people together so he could teach, you know. Um, but he probably had other people doing that, but he had to lay down some ground rules. He laid down rules for the monks, you know, so he's thinking ahead that we have to lay, lay down these different rules and, and stuff so that we don't have any problems in the future, and on and on and on. So he was living a life very much, you know, probably the way we are as, as far as the cognition and the thought goes. But he was doing it from this place of presence, and so he wasn't identifying there uh, with with being and doing that where the suffering can creep in. And so, in other words, nothing uh, as far as um, being happy, be com being complete, being um, being enlightened, if you will. We talked about enlightenment last night. Um, nothing out there has to change for us, it's just our view of it and how we deal with everything out there, how we see it, how we work with it. And for the most part, um, it is coming, it's, it's us operating from this place of presence. And we can experience that presence in our formal meditation practice, you know, which we will do here in a couple of minutes. But we, but that's not the only place that we can actually experience that. We can experience it in everyday living as well, and that's where our happiness in everyday living comes from. But our happiness also comes from being inspired with life. And the best way to to be inspired by life is to understand that presence and 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 dip into that as much as we can and understand that that's our true nature. And that is where we are coming from. Every plan that we have for the future, we have to realize that we don't have 100% control of that, you know. It's just something that we are creating in the mind. And we can, uh, we're, we can be wonderful, wonderful creators. Um, and we can manifest, you know, incredible things. But we have to realize that if they don't uh, manifest in w the way in which we w intend, that that's just a part of that's a part of life. The preferences that we have, we have to know that's what they are. All they are is preferences, and they don't they can turn out any way they want to turn out, basically. And if we're okay with that, and in the present moment, it'll be fine. We won't care. I hope that's clear. We'll do a meditation here, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the meditation. 
And uh, the main thing is that we all get comfortable right now. So if you're not comfortable and you want to grab another cushion, there's plenty of cushions and, and everything. Um, if you get uncomfortable and you want to move to a chair or something like that, that's fine too. Just try to keep the noise down as much as you can for your for the neighbor, for the person's next, people next to you. Feel free to close the eyes. Some people do like to meditate with the eyes partially open. They're kind of like letting a little bit of light through the eyelids. And that's fine as well. But I think most people find that when the eyes are the eyelids are completely closed, we have an ability to to really go within a little bit deeper level than we would with the eyes open. And it really does seem to help our concentration. So with the eyes closed, bring your attention to the breath for a few moments. And notice where your attention lands when I ask you to do that. And ask yourself, is this the place where I feel the breath the most? If I was going to focus on something, for, if I was asked to focus on something for an hour, could I focus on this aspect of the breath? for that long, or could I at least return to it and come back to it again and again? And if you feel like that is the area of the breath on the body or the movement of the body, the feeling of the breath, the sensation of the breath somehow as we relate to it, if this seems like your spot, then that's something that you want to kind of cherish. Because everybody focuses on the breath in a different way, in a different place. Now, generally when we start our meditation, people are very, very focused. They kind of feel like it's a relief that their day is kind of settling down. that they can withdraw their attention on worldly matters, accept the invitation to go within, bring the attention to something as simple as the breath, And in that aspect, meditation can be very beautiful, very wonderful way of distressing and sort of picking up the pieces um, of life again by introducing our true nature to ourselves. We bring ourselves to a nice quiet room, try to be comfortable, very few noises, 
not too many visual things happening, especially with the eyes closed. Not too many strange sense, senses, uh, as far as smells and tastes are happening. Very neutral, we could say. But if something didn't go well, there's a pain in the body, for example, or a loud noise, there's some kind of agitation of any kind, we would notice that our preference for things to be a little bit different would really throw our meditation off. And of course, this can happen throughout our days, too. And for some people, this happens constantly throughout their lives, with them having that realization, or maybe even possibly not even realizing that they're in a state of preferring things to be different all the time. So when we think back on our day, this very day right now, and if I asked you to remember a time when you had a very strong preference for something to be a different way, a certain way, maybe a better, more of something or even less of something, just a preference for things to be different, can you remember one of those preferences. How about a, a preference that happened this evening? It's about 7.30 now. Was there any preferences between, let's say, 5 o'clock and our time now. Preference to have more time to arrive here. Preference for maybe a, to see somebody here or maybe a friend to come with you or something. or preference to just simply get out of the house and come to a meditation center. And so there's physical preferences and then there's mental preferences. If the body is uncomfortable, uh, we can shift the body. That's, that's a preference. Sometimes it's very subtle and, and subconscious. We don't even know that we're shifting. A piece of hair falls on our forehead and causes an itch, and sometimes we can itch it without even realizing we're doing it, particularly outside of meditation. And we can have the mental preferences, the preference for not to be agitated by a memory, perhaps. Not to worry about something that we feel might happen in the future, or a meeting or some kind of uh, an appointment that we're dreading in the future.
So some of the preferences that we have are anything that could be fearful that will happen in the future, or any kind of anger or even hatred that happened in the past. These, are, these can be very, very strong preferences, and they can be a part of the, the, our desires as well, which can encompass both the past and the future. And typically, meditation is not a time to visit these things and to look at these things. But the idea here is to understand when we don't have the preferences and to primarily understand these preferences are completely mind-made. Preferences that are mental, created by thought. Consistent thought creates feelings and feelings create states of mind, mind states. These preferences are all mind-made. And they're very much a part of our lives, very natural. But as meditators, if we set the intention to sit in meditation, and come our, bring our attention into the present moment. We're asking ourselves to relinquish all of these preferences, at least for a moment while we're in meditation. And so these preferences can act as um, triggers or signals for us. We have to remember that they're completely natural completely normal. But the invitation is that whenever we notice one of these preferences, that we bring our attention back to the breath, which means back to this presence. And back to this present moment. And we can experiment with this and notice that when we are present, we're, we are absolutely fine. There's no worries, there's no restlessness, and there's no fear or anger or desire. The preferences are, are not there. As long as we are in that state of presence. And so we want to do a little investigative work and notice when our attention shifts from this present moment awareness uh, to any kind of thought or preference of, of things to be different than what they currently are. Past, future, or more of this, or less of that.
If our attention is not already there, let's bring our attention to the breath. Take a little deeper than normal inhalation. Bring some energy into the body. Then slowly exhale this air. Do this again, feel the air coming in a little deeper than normal. Slowly exhale. And then one more deep, deeper than normal inhalation. May each and every one of us be well, happy, and peaceful. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May we all have spiritual and worldly success. May we have the patience, courage, and the understanding to meet and overcome any problems or any difficulties that we might face in life. Thank you. So the theme was uh, suffering or um, desires, actually, and, pr and um, our preferences. And um, the idea is to, to know when the preferences are there and how that can affect us. They will be there. <laughs> they will be there. But we just have to r realize that they're there, and then they won't have that grip on us. Any, basically, anything that we attach to that gets sticky including these attachments, there are these desires and these, these preferences. If we can't let them go easily, that they'll cause problems for us. So we could kind of revert that all back and say, it's not really the, the desires that cause the suffering, it's our uh, inability you know, to let go of these things, these desires, and these preferences, these things that we want, or want to change, or on and on and on. So we must uh, really learn to accept our circumstances, accept our uh, situation, and uh, let go of whatever needs to be let go of, whatever is whatever's causing harm, mental or physical. Any comments? Or Jennifer? Recommendations on how to let go and accept? How to let go? Well, first of all, we have to see it. You know, we have to know what it is and know know that it's there. Usually, by see you know by seeing it, we we know that it's causing discomfort within the mind or the body somehow. In meditation, what we want to do, and there's the ways to do it with outside of meditation, but inside the formal practice of meditation, we just simply want to come back into that presence, and it's not always going to be easy. You know, if there's something that keeps disturbing our mind, you know, it's 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 like we constantly have to come back. You know, you know the analogy of the puppy. You know, bringing the puppy back. Outside of meditation, um, there's other you know uh, worldly things that we can do, and one of them that uh, is to perhaps use something like the mala, and um, something called um, you know, thought replacement. And this is something that can be very effective when we are, have this, these th thoughts that keep coming into our consciousness and they keep kind of badgering us. They're always there, always there, always there. And we want to find some relief from them. And so when we place our attention on something else, they immediately, immediately falls away. And we f immediately feel better. I mean, we can feel that within us. And the, the, one of the way, ways that you can do it, like with the mala, is to every bead that you pass through your finger, you just think of some, um, a very positive word, like um, if, if there's something on my mind that I couldn't get rid of, um, you know, using the mala, I might say love compassion, generosity, 
um, and you just keep on going. So what the mind is doing is searching for these positive things again and again. It's um, you know keeping the mind active, but keeping it active, you know, finding and searching for positive, positive things. And you can go through if you go through this, you know, that's a couple of minutes of looking for these positive things and. After a while, I mean, we'll, you, you'll, we'll see that it works. You know that there's this this space, you know, in between the thoughts and um, this. Uh, it, what we're actually doing is becoming very present, um, even outside of meditation. You know, by doing that, a counselor of any type, they'll probably tell you to, to keep active. You know practice um, physical activities, you know, yoga or, you know, um, stay active, keep the mind, you know, somewhat busy and that type of thing. Generally, it's just the awareness alone. You know, awareness is really the king uh, of, of all the difficulties that we have. And it's, and it's oftentimes just the awareness of what is happening that will uh, allow it to dissipate and disarm itself. And it, it's something that can uh, be very, very profound, especially in the practice of meditation in the form of insight. If we, uh, and this probably happened to a lot of us here, that we have this very, very difficult situation happening, and then we, we, we're in meditation, and this insight comes up of, of how, you know, this this clear mental um, uh, pathway, we could say, shines its light on the situation. And it's, it's like it just vanishes, it's gone. It's completely disintegrated, not to come back anymore, because it's, it's seen through for what it is. Anybody ever have that experience? And that's what insight can do. And the only way that insight can come up is through that presence, that present moment that we're talking about, that still presence in between the thoughts. And uh, when, whenever we're thinking of, we're caught in the past and caught in the future or simultaneously caught in, in both of them, we don't get a chance to uh, think clearly many times. And it's not intentional thinking, um, but it's just allowing the insight, clarity of mind to come up for us. It, it sounds easy, but when we come into that present moment, it stops. I mean, it's like there's peace. And if we get a taste of that again and again and again, just kind of widen those gaps, then we understand how the mind is actually working. Because there is there is a room to t room to breathe there, you know, within that that present moment. A lot of people would liken that to the end of uh, this lifetime, the presence, the present moment. What's it like to die peacefully, you know, to be in that present moment, and to just rest in that you know, for for eternity we could say you know it's just a, a imagining um, what it would be like and I think for a lot of people that points to um, Nirvana or um, you know the mind of an Arhant you know somebody that's fully awakened uh, within that that state of presence everything is fine it's like the uh, rough water you know the uh, the the water is really rough on a windy day and but when, when you, we dive into the water and go down below it's as calm as can be you know, like the mind like the mind can be okay well thank you all um if Tell your friends and family to watch this on YouTube. Um, this is live stream. And uh, if you want to come back and revisit this or any of the other weekly meditations, it's all on YouTube there. 
And what we do is we come back and, and edit, uh, uh, edit them up a little bit so that the, the time is reduced a little bit. So there's not so, you know, so you're not wasting an hour and a half when you're watching it. Um, uh, watching silence, you know, too much silence. So check it out. So again, thank you everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>